Hello and welcome back to Brigham Young University Hawaii's online economics course. Today we're talking about chapter 4. We're going to extend some of the applications of demand and supply and the learning objectives that we're going to try and consider today are to learn how to apply the model of demand and supply to explain the behavior of equilibrium prices, in other words the movement of equilibrium prices and quantities in a variety of markets. We're going to explain how technological change can be represented using the models of demand and supply and we're going to explain how the model of demand and supply can be used to explain changes in the prices of stock shares that you would buy on the New York Stock Exchange through your local brokers. So let's go ahead and get started. We're first going to look at the market for computers and this is an interesting table just because it identifies the markets for computers here in the worldwide market and you see clearly Dell is at the top with 18.9 percent of the total shipments and then the market for computers in the United States. One of the most notable things that you see in both of these markets is the presence or lack of presence of a company called Apple. In worldwide shipments, its shipments are fairly small and so it doesn't even really register as one of the top computer companies. In US shipments, it does register, and there it is, but it only has 3.9% of the total market, relatively small. The reason why this is particularly important and why we want to bring it up in this discussion is that in a global perspective there's a lot more producers. There's many more computer manufacturers. <clears throat> As there are more and more computer manufacturers in any market, the supply of computers increases. And as the supply of computers increases, it causes a shift in the equilibrium price and quantity of the computers themselves. So we're going to put that on a graph really quickly. And the graphs are going to move around and the lines are going to change and it's going to look a little confusing, but just keep thinking about it conceptually and think about what is happening. Uh, we start out with an equilibrium position here at price one and quantity one. Equilibrium is where demand one crosses supply curve one. And that all seems to make good sense. But Then what we're going to do is the computer markets are going to see an increase in supply and demand. So we're going to add more and more computer manufacturers to the mix. We're going to allow them to sell around the world. We're not going to constrain any of the computer markets. And so what you're going to see is a shift in the supply curve because more entrants have come into the market. So the supply curve is going to shift and that's going to inherently drop the equilibrium price from this point to this point but while supply is shifting expanding the market we're also having an increase in demand and the reason why you'd have an increase in demand is all of a sudden we have more computers in the market we have an interesting array of potential options and technologies causing more and more people to enter the market for computers so our demand curve is going to shift here to the demand two our supply curve is going to shift from this supply curve to supply to and we're going to establish a new equilibrium and the new equilibrium is here where price two and quantity two are the new price and quantity at equilibrium what you can say about this is that the two events that I just described cause a decrease in price and a corresponding increase in quantity now sometimes demand and supply curves shift in a way that makes it fairly difficult to understand what is taking place in price and quantity. Um, so you just have to watch the curves and make sure that you understand why they're moving and where they're moving. Let's do another example. Let's take the example of crude oil and gasoline. Now crude oil is an interesting substance. It typically comes in prices as a barrel. And this is an example of a $35 a barrel crude. So at $35 a barrel, our supply curve is here, our demand curve is here, our equilibrium quantity is Q1. Okay, what happens when the demand for crude oil increases? Well, <clears throat> demand for crude oil rises. Uh, maybe it rises because it's a Labor Day holiday. Maybe it rises uh, for other purposes. Everybody's parked their hybrids and has decided to drive their SUVs. So demand for crude oil increases. Price for crude oil changes. We have a new equilibrium price where it's $140 and our quantity is now at Q2. So I'll be able to explain how that works and why it works. Um, what we have is setting a new equilibrium as our price goes up from 35 to 140 and our quantity in equilibrium goes from Q1 to Q2. Similar things may occur 
in the gasoline markets, which are a derivative of crude oil. We take crude oil, we refine it, um, and we produce gasoline and a number of other byproducts. But what's interesting is you can also look at the supply and demand curves here and see something unique and interesting happening. So consider what's happening in the United States right now with the limiting of drilling in the Gulf of Mexico. With the explosion of the Horizon oil rig and the leaking of the largest spill in the, in the United States history, President Obama has put a moratorium on drilling. This moratorium significantly reduces the amount of supply of crude oil in the market, consequently also reducing the supply of gasoline in the market. So what you're going to see is your supply curve, which was here at S1, is going to shift now back to S2, and the result is going to be a new equilibrium. We were at equilibrium here with this price and this quantity. Now we move to a new equilibrium under supply curve 2 and our previous demand curve, and our new equilibrium price is higher, and our new equilibrium quantity is lower. This is a real-world application of some of the things that we've been talking about in class. So just be able to, for your exam purposes and other assignments, be able to watch the supply and demand curve shift, be able to understand what it does to equilibrium price and quantity, and be able to conceptually describe that. Let's talk about the stock market. We need to do a few definitions to be able to understand this. A sole proprietorship is a situation in which one individual owns a firm. You may have come to school with a skill in welding, and you figure, you know what, I can weld instead of work at the PCC. So I'm going to put my little shingle out in front of my dorm and say, I'm a welder, and I am willing to weld anything you need welded. So that's a sole proprietorship. That's a single individual who owns the firm. He makes all the decisions in the firm, <clears throat> and he bears all the risk of the firm. If the firm goes down, he goes down. If he has some bills with outside vendors, and they want to collect, they can come in and take his personal belongings um, as well as anything that he owns to use with the firm. Partnership is a situation very similar to a proprietorship except that there's more than one person who own the firm. In a partnership, everybody who's in the firm shares the responsibility of running the firm. What's interesting about a partnership is sometimes you're able to maximize efficiency because you may have in a partnership, if you take our previous example, you may have one person in the partnership who knows how to weld. And this person may find a really, really bright and capable saleswoman, and she goes out and sells the product and is able to, while the welder is in his office or in his shop welding, the marketing and salesperson is out, able to go out and sell the product and service. And then they may have another very, very dull, dull and boring person who's the accountant and they're going to manage the books of the firm. And so because each one of those three people are able to maximize their own capabilities, the net value of the firm and the net productivity of the firm may increase. And that's really why partnerships are developed. The problem with a partnership is that everybody still bears personal responsibility for the activities, for the debts, for the liabilities of the firm. So we created this very interesting entity called a corporation. And it's a relatively new thing. However, the idea of a corporation is not particularly new. If you are a fan of Pirates of the Caribbean, you'll know that there is a company, a couple of companies. One is called the Dutch East India Trading Company. And that is one of the first corporations. It had its own legal entity. It uh, behaved like an individual and was treated with the rights of an individual. A corporation is just a situation in which shareholders, you and I, can own individual stock in a firm. But what the most important component of a corporation is they have limited liability. Remember in our discussion of both partnerships and proprietorships, the individuals in those businesses bore personal responsibility for the liabilities of the firm. In a shareholder, it's different. As a shareholder, it's different in a corporation. If I buy shares of General Electric as a corporation on the stock exchange, I don't bear any responsibility for the behavior of that company. My liability as a shareholder, as a partial owner, is limited. And that's a very, very powerful tool. It allows corporations to take on risks that they wouldn't otherwise take on. 
both good and bad. But the evolution of the idea of a corporation has been one of the greatest business and economic evolutions that we've ever experienced in the modern world. Corporate stocks. Now, if I have a corporation and I want to sell some shares in this corporation to raise money, I could come to you and your family and say, here's this business, it's a really good business, would you like to own a piece of it? I could sell that piece in the form of a share certificate. And I would give you that share certificate, you would give me some money, and now you would be a partial owner of that company. What I sold you is a corporate stock. It's a share of the company, represented by a certificate. In the stock market, we constantly are trading those stocks for money. And most investors try and find stocks that are undervalued and buy them with the expectation that in the future they're going to increase in value. The stock market is just a place where we go to buy those things. Now, historically, the stock markets have been a physical location. The New York Stock Exchange uh, in the Wall Street area of New York has been a physical location where people went and bought and sold stock. Most of those things are virtual now. Most of them are electronic. You can get a trading account with E-Trade and you can purchase stocks through your online account. The exchange is an electronic exchange for the most part where computers end up talking to one another and buying and selling stock. But you still end up buying the stock. You still end up getting the certificate. Now what do we end up buying when we buy a share of stock? Well, there's a couple of things we need to talk about. One is called retained earnings and one is called dividends. Any company that has profits you know, they'll sell their product, they have some expenses, they take the expenses out, they pay their taxes, and then they have some profit. At the end when you have profit, you have roughly two things that you can do with your profit. One is you can retain the earnings. And earnings are profits, but you can either retain them or you can dividend them. Those are your really your only two choices as a company. If you retain the earnings, that just means that you keep that money inside the company and you use that money to grow or to acquire another company or do other things. If you were to dividend the, the money, if from that investment or from that to profit you have retained earnings or dividends, if you were to dividend, what that means is you send that money out to the shareholders and you distribute those profits. So let's talk about demand and supply in the stock market. Here's our equilibrium demand and supply and we're talking about a price per share of stock. And what we're saying is that the equilibrium price here is $25 a share. And this is the number of shares per day that are sold at that equilibrium price. Now let's move some things around just a little bit. Let's say that what happens is we have a change in the demand for the stock. Now what could cause this change in demand? In the case of this individual stock, we're considering Intel. Perhaps Intel comes out with a new processor. We now have a new, much faster, much more energy efficient uh, microprocessor. Intel is very excited about it. All the investors are also excited and they look at this and say, this really is a game changer. We expect future earnings to rise because of this new chip. Consequently, demand for the stock is going to increase. So your demand here is going to move, going to shift to the right, expanding the market for these stocks, and you're going to change your equilibrium price and quantity correspondingly. Now you can also have a change in supply. <clears throat> you can have a reduction in supply of stock because the individual company in, in this particular case, Intel, may decide, you know what, we are going to buy some of our shares back. We're, we think our shares are undervalued, so we're going to buy some of them and put them back in our pockets, in our treasury. So you can have a shift in the supply curve, um, equally shifting backwards because we took our, some of the supply of stock out of the market. Those two events cause a change in equilibrium from this point here at this price and quantity to this point, P2, at this price and quantity. So you have an increase in the price and an increase in the quantity of shares supplied. 
interesting. And this is basically the way the stock market works. Now we're going to talk about some very bizarre and interesting applications of supply and demand. Number one, we're going to use the model of supply and demand to explain what happens when government imposes price floors and price ceilings. In other words, government's involvement in the market. The government sees that there's a market failure, they need to, to act in some way, so they get active in the market. Number two, we're going to discuss the reasons why governments sometimes choose to control, control prices and the consequences of price control policies. And what you see is there's a very interesting law of unintended consequences. So before we move on to the agriculture price force, let's just talk about this law of unintended consequences. When I was very young and a new father, um, dental fillings were very expensive. Because dental fillings were expensive, we restricted our young children's access to candy. We didn't have the money to pay for fillings. So we figured if fillings are, at least in some way, derived or catalyzed by eating sugar, then our best way to reduce fillings is to reduce sugar. So every Saturday in the morning, we would have candy day. And we would allow our kids to eat candy. They loved it. They got sick pretty quickly and then didn't want to have any more. But what was interesting is that over time, the United States and some other countries have found that fluoride added to water and to toothpaste and to mouthwashes would harden the enamel of your teeth and make it harder for cavities to form. So because we saw that there was an increased cost in families trying to pay for cavities, and we said as a government, look, cavities are bad. We don't want people to have cavities. So we're going to start regulating this, and we're going to start saying, well, we should put fluoride in more things. And we did that. And slowly we began to fluoride various things, and our tooth decay went down because fluoride was quite effective. And we started to say, well, wait a minute. So I don't have to restrict my kids' exposure to candy now because fluoride has come to the rescue and is taking care of the cavities of my kids. So what did we do? We said, sugar, candy, all this stuff that caused cavities is now good to go. Go and eat as much of it as you want. What happened? Well, we created the most obese generation in U.S. history. We certainly have fewer cavities, but now we have the fastest growing um, rise in another very, very dangerous disease called diabetes largely tied to the fact that we eat a lot more candy, a lot more carbohydrates, and a lot more sweet things with heavy corn syrup in it because fluoride made cavities irrelevant. And so we said, bring on the sugar. We're not going to get cavities now. So what's the law of unintended consequences? It is that as soon as we step into the market and think we can manipulate the market and change it around, a lot of things happen that we didn't expect. Those are the laws of unintended consequences. And agricultural price floors are just a great example of this. A price floor is a minimum allowable price set above the equilibrium price. Now, just think about this as being counterintuitive. We have an equilibrium price. The price floor is going to be above that equilibrium price. And the price ceiling is going to be below it. So just remember that this seems a little counterintuitive. It's going to make some sense here in just a minute, but it does seem a little strange at the outset. So a price floor is a minimum allowable price set above the equilibrium price. We're going to consider wheat here because wheat's a very interesting story. So here's the example of wheat's demand and supply. What you see is you have supply curve here, and you have a demand curve here, and you have an equilibrium price. Now, where does the government come involved here? Well, very interestingly, they said, wait a minute. Food supply is really, really important. And we have all these farmers out there that because of the Great Depression started to lose their jobs, lose their farms. And we thought, you know, probably the reason why they're losing their farms is just because prices for agricultural commodities are just way too low. In particular, this price for wheat is too low. And farmers can't make enough money to survive and to keep their farms because the price is too low. And so what we said is, we're going to change that. And we're going to put in a price floor. 
And we're going to say that this price floor is now this new price here, and it's higher than the equilibrium price because farmers need to survive. So we're going to artificially put in place this price floor. And at this price floor, though, we forgot that markets actually behave on their own. And at this price floor, what do you know? Well, you know you have this much demand. So here's your quantity demanded. And you have this much supply. So you have more supply than you have demand. Because you have more supply than demand, you have a surplus. Because at this higher price, farmers are saying, yeah, I'm going to plant corn. I'm going to plant wheat from post to post on my farm. Because the prices are now high enough for me to make some real money. Buy the new tractor, buy the new truck, expand my barn. Uh, prices are good and farmers are happy. But at that higher price, people are not willing to pay for that much wheat. So the equilibrium quantity, which was about here, ends up dropping in terms of demand. That makes sense? What's interesting about this is the net result. So the government puts in this price floor above the equilibrium price, and now they have a surplus of wheat. Well, I didn't think that was so bad at the front end because we needed to store wheat for the rainy day. Remember Jake or Joseph in Egypt? And we said, okay, this is a good idea. So the government started to build enormous silos throughout the Midwest to store wheat. And they filled those silos and wheat stores for a while, but not for forever. And as year by year by year went on, we found that we continued to store more and more wheat. We filled up our silos, and this wheat started to expire, started to rot. So one of the bright sparks in the agricultural department said, you know what, I can fix this. What we should do is pay them to not grow wheat. So now in our agricultural system, you as a farmer, can go and register with the Department of Agriculture and say, I'm going to grow wheat. And they'll say, no, 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 we don't need wheat. We'll pay you to not grow wheat. So now, farmers get paid, they survive, they grow no wheat, our surplus goes away, and we end up being able to have the right amount of quantity of wheat to satisfy the market. Interesting. Law of unintended consequences. So, <clears throat> What you see in agricultural markets is just a significant change and alteration of the general market dynamics, which we're fairly comfortable with. And they always experience the law of unintended consequences. Let's take another look at rental prices. In this environment, we're going to look at ceilings. And this is an interesting case because it takes place throughout the United States, most notably in large cities like New York, uh, other cities like San Francisco. But what you have here is you have an equilibrium price which is your rental apartment uh, per period, and you have an equilibrium amount of apartments per year at that price. Now, the problem is the government stepped in there and said, well, what about the poor people? They can't afford that price, and they need to live. They need to be able to live fairly close to where they're working, so this doesn't seem fair. And so what we ended up creating is a price ceiling. Now, price ceiling, remember, we said this was counterintuitive, and so our price ceiling is going to show up not above us where our ceilings usually are, but below us, because it's going to set a maximum allowable price below the equilibrium price. So there's our price ceiling, and what do we know at the price ceiling? Well, there's our supply, so we're going to have supply somewhere around here, and we're going to have demand somewhere around here. So at a price lower than the market price, there's going to be more demand than there is supply. And that's fairly intuitive and obvious. And what it creates is a shortage. Because the government says you can't charge market rates, you have to charge lower than market rates, there's less supply and more demand. And consequently, a shortage exists. I have a wonderful friend who passed away about five years ago named John Curtin. Uh, he was the head and CEO of Curtin Trading Company. Traded about 40% of the New York Futures Exchange volume at one point. He passed away because he was uh, very large and his heart just ended up giving out. But one of the nicest human beings that I have ever known. What's interesting is he lived alone for the time he was 14. He was born in New York City in the Upper East Side. And where he was born, his parents had gotten into a rent-controlled apartment. And in this rent-controlled apartment, 
the rent was only allowed to go up in minor, minor movements to adjust for inflation, not for market values. And so he was born in this home. At age of 14, he lost both of his parents. He went down to hall to one of his neighbors and said, hey, look, if you'll sign on as my guardian, I'll collect the social security checks from my parents and I'll give you a little bit and I'll just live by myself. She said, hey, that sounds fine to me. Uh, she did it. He lived by himself from the time he was 14 to the time he died when he was 50. What's interesting is that he lived in exactly the same apartment. And he lived in an apartment that has a market value of about $6,000 per month. He paid about $300. And the reason why he paid $300 is because he was in a rent-controlled apartment. The price didn't continue to move up. So when people get into rent-controlled apartments, they tend to stay in them because it's a lot more expensive to go out into the market. What's interesting is that this shortage causes real problems. Because there's a shortage, people don't want to supply apartments at that price. The rents are so low that owners of apartments don't fix them. Um, and it creates some really weird and interesting behaviors. The owners of apartments, since they can't charge a higher rate or they can't charge the market rate for rentals, they start to do things like charging extraordinarily large sign-on bonuses or contracts or deposits. Ten, fifteen, twenty thousand dollars $20,000 as a deposit. Well, clearly the poor can't afford a $20,000 deposit. And so you end up doing something that gets us back to something that looks like market equilibrium, and we do it through deposits. So price ceilings exert another thing that we've talked about twice before, which is this law of unintended consequences. Every time the government gets involved, we have the situation where the law of unintended consequences take over, and the net effect or the net desire of what they tried to establish as a, as a rent control position doesn't really work. So just make sure you can you can work your way through those graphs and, and understand the basic concepts of both surpluses and shortages. Now we're going to talk about healthcare, and this is going to end this section. The learning objective here is to use the model of supply and demand to explain the effects of third party payers, that's our insurance companies, on the healthcare market and on healthcare spending. Now remember, <clears throat> healthcare has been recently changed in the United States. This graph's a little bit dated, but what it shows is that. <clears throat> The percentage of our total U.S. output spent on health care, and you can see that it's getting up here around 16%. Well, reality is in 2009, this number reached and exceeded 18%. So this line has continued to move forward, and we are spending almost 20% of our U.S. output on health care. That's remarkable. Other countries that have health care systems that are considered to be as good as ours, spend six to seven, maybe eight percent. So we're spending significantly more to get the same amount of quality in health care as other countries. So because of that, the Obama administration and some others decided, you know what, we need to revamp health care. We need to change the way it works. So first of all, let's understand where we are in the health care system, how our health care system works, and what we would do in the original market conditions. To do that, you need to understand what a third party payer is. It's an agent other than the seller or the buyer who pays part of the price of the good or service. So when you go into the doctor's office, typically you'll pay a co-payment. It could be $10. Uh, the total price of the visit could be $50. So the third party payer, the insurance company, pays the difference, pays the 40. That's what third party payers do. But think about the, what this does to your behavior. Do you see the cost of your doctor's visit as $50? You don't. You see it as 10. We've had this discussion around our own kitchen table. We're going to the doctor tomorrow. What's it going to cost? It's going to cost $10 because that's what our copayment is. Okay, we don't think about 50 because that's somebody else's responsibility. So our behavior is changing because we are perceiving that the value or cost of this service is ten dollars not fifty so we end up over consuming health care now let's talk about it and watch how that works so here's our equilibrium supply and demand let's just say that the price per visit is thirty dollars 
At $30, we're going to demand 1 million visits per week to the physician. Okay, so our total spending is just price times quantity or $30, million, or $30 times 1 million, which is $30 million. Okay, let's consider another alternative. Here we are, there's our 30. There's our 1 million visits. The market's in equilibrium. We're fine. However, there are some in our society who can't afford the $30 visit to your hospital or to your physician, and that's a problem. So what the government does and what insurance companies do is they say, you know what, we need to try and fix that and what we'll do is we'll spread the risk of people's individual medical conditions across a broad spectrum of people. And what that ends up re doing is resulting in a very interesting change. With insurance, the number of office visits increases at $50 per visit because the total number of visits goes up to $1.5 million. So take a look at the graph. At $50, what do you do? You have a supply, in other words, the doctors who are out there supplying visits increases to $1.5 million. Doctors who receive $50 per visit. Now what's interesting is patients pay $10 per visit. Where before insurance we paid 30 and had an equilibrium number of visits of a million. Now with insurance, we pay 10, doctors receive 50, and the insurers, the insurance company, pays the 40. So the total spending becomes 50 times 1.5 million, or $75 million in total. You see what happens with insurance? We move from an equilibrium of 1 million visits and $30 per visit and $30 million total spend to a new situation where we have $50 per visit, 1.5 million visits, and we've spent $75 million in total spending. So insurance causes us to overconsume because we still perceive the cost of that individual visit as $10, not $50. Now the Obama administration has recently enacted a series of controls, a series of changes to our medical system to try and bring this total spending down. History tells us that it will be different. History tells us that there are laws of unintended consequences that will step into this and change whatever our objectives were, however noble they may have been. So we'll have to watch for those and watch as they unfold after 2013 and beyond. So this is the end of this section and I hope you have success in studying it and we'll see you in the next video.